Brothers and sisters, I invite you now to read with me from the Word of God this morning in the Old Testament from the prophecy according to Joel. And we're going to read from, from chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. First reading this morning from Joel chapter 2. After that, we'll read Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 8. This is the word of God. Then the Lord was jealous for his land, and he took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Suddenly the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you will... You wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing the fruit, the fig trees and the vine, their um, riches. Be glad, people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains, because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rain. As before, threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay for you the years of the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts and other locusts and locusts swarm. My great army that I send among you, you will have plenty to eat until you are full And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then um, you will know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other people, um, that that there is no other. Never again will my people be be ashamed. Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 1. And we'll read verse 1 to 8. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has said by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The text this morning, uh, our focus will be verses 6 to 8 of of Acts 1, which we just read.
Loved ones in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not so long ago, we celebrated Easter. And in a few weeks' time, we hope to commemorate Jesus' ascension. And the four Gospels recorded quite a few events and conversations between Jesus and his disciples during the, these 40 days between his resurrection and ascension. And in our text, we find one of the most distinct conversations. And what, what a remarkable conversation it is indeed. It's about the place of God's people in his kingdom and, and the future role of God, the Spirit, in this as well. The disciples were, were quite surprised by the way Jesus led this conversation. It didn't go the way they anticipated it. But, hey, that's often how it goes. When, when asking Jesus questions... His answers are often quite remarkable. Nevertheless, it also encouraged them to take on the challenging calling by, that, that lay ahead of, of them. Now, brothers and sisters, this talk between Jesus and his disciples is also encouraging for us. As we, too, sometimes struggle with our expectations of God's timing of events. We too have our questions, right, about God's timing regarding our task and our place in His church and kingdom. For example, how will our congregation here in Covenant develop? When will we receive a new pastor? Um, will we be able to reach out to more people in our community with the gospel? You know, all sorts of questions about God's ways and, and His timing in allowing things to, to happen for us. And we hope to find some direction this morning from this text. And I preach you the gospel as follows. Jesus teaches his church how to observe the times in God's kingdom. We'll focus on three elements. First, the disciples long for the restoration of this kingdom, verse 6. Uh, the Father determines the, the, the timing of this kingdom, verse 7. In the third place, the Holy Spirit works powerfully in this kingdom, verse 8. Just a question to the, to the children, boys and girls. I'm sure you've asked your parents somewhere in the past year, maybe half year, Mom and Dad, when is this whole COVID thing going to, to finish, to come to an end? And I'm sure there's a question that we as parents, as adults, also have asked. We, we chose us again that we have become... Uh, very dependent, so to speak, on, on, on the timing of events. If you can remember, we had all our, time, our plans ready for, well, 2020, and then, then COVID hit. And this, in this and through this, God reminded us and continued to remind us that we cannot look into the future. And thus we have learned to depend more consciously on the Lord for whatever the future brings. But we have also learned, brothers and sisters, that He looks after us in every way, in every detail of our lives, every minute, every second of the day. He cares for us because we are of more value than the birds and the grass. 
He sustains us every day. We confess with Lord's Day 8 and Lord's Day 10 of the Harderberg Catechism that nothing will happen without His sovereign will and plan. And I'm sure this is, this is a great comfort. Even when we, we are a bit nervous about future perspectives. And yet, let's be honest. We still like to be in control of our lives, don't we? We still have the desire for things to, to develop the way we want it to go. Sometimes we are control freaks, if you know what I mean. Or at least we, we hope that things will develop in such a harmonious way that we will not struggle too much with whatever the Lord allows to happen in His kingdom and in this world. Francis is in our text, we, we sense a similar desire. The disciples of Jesus are longing for the full coming of God's kingdom. Now, during the 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus often spoke about God's kingdom. We can find that in Acts 1 verse 3 and Luke 24 verse 5. Jesus uh, spoke about this kingdom, but he also uh, opened the minds of his of his disciples, that they could understand the scriptures. And then from, from the book of Joel, which we read, and I think the text is somewhere else um, in the uh, New King James Version than in the NIV, but the reason you find that is, is that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in the Messianic age and time. Now, Jesus confirmed this in, in Acts 1.5b, where he says, you, you will be baptized, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so, we understand that the disciples had this intense longing for the coming of the kingdom. Because that, uh, their minds were open on what this kingdom will look like. And now in, the, in our text, they, they express their longing for the coming of this kingdom. Verse 6. Lord, are you at this time going to, to restore the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, to Israel? Now many read this as that they had some sort of nationalistic Jewish expectation consisting the restoration of, of the kingdom of David and, and, and to overthrow the Roman oppressors. But that's not the case. No, they came to understand that the coming kingdom will be, will be uh, spiritually of nature. But they were curious whether Jesus is going to restore this spiritual kingdom to Israel in the foreseeable future. And, and will it happen in our age, our times, Lord? Will you, Lord, soon, will the Father soon establish the Messianic kingdom with Israel as the center with the coming of the Holy Spirit? And will this kingdom be for the benefit of, of their people, of Israel, as the, Joel, uh, the prophet Joel prophesied? And, and then also for all the peoples of the earth. Remarkable here at congregation is that Jesus did not give a, a direct answer to their question. Now, one might expect for the Lord Jesus to immediately respond positively to their sincere longing and desire, but he doesn't. Why not? Were they impudent or impertinent about asking such a thing? Was it an inappropriate question? Because they forgot that, that God's kingdom is, is in fact eternal of nature? Well, not necessarily, brothers and sisters, because the consummation of God's kingdom may be eternal. But the kingdom, is, kingdom itself is specifically linked to this time and age. And Jesus already said that the kingdom 
is, is coming and developing and growing at that moment. This was clear from, from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 5, where Jesus spoke extensively about the kingdom. And he would not have spent so much time on this topic of the kingdom if it was a, a reality that was outside of their scope or experience. No, God's kingdom is, is not only eternal, but also here and now in this age. It is a concrete part of, of everyday life. We too may be part of this, this kingdom. But still leaves us with a question, why did Jesus not respond readily and positively to, to their question, their longing? Francis, it seems that their desire, their timely desire for the kingdom of God, the, the, the problem was not so much their curious question, but that they were too much focused on the timing of God's, of the kingdom's coming. They were unnecessarily concerned with God's kingdom clock, if I may use that word, or, or calendar. And then indirectly, how this is going to affect their position. And that's where Jesus respond, that's why Jesus responded the way he did. Because they were like, can I say, they, they were like soldiers who during uh, the battle would ask, oh, how long will this battle last? You know, when, when will the peace we have been waiting for so long, the, the consummation of the kingdom, our victory, how long will it take to eventuate? You see, brothers and sisters, these, such soldiers are not kingdom outcome focused, but, but time focused. They seem to have lost the, the focus on, on the battle, the spiritual battle they're engaged in. They've lost sight of the promises of God and, and their calling here and now. Instead, their focus shifted to the consummation of Jesus' kingdom. And sadly, you often find a similar focus in, in maybe in our hearts too, or I know in some other churches, the focus is very much on results, uh, very much around the calculation of events in the kingdom of God. For example, when will Jesus return? Do we know the time? Can we calculate that? Can we predict it? Jesus says, no. That's not your task. It's not your calling. It's not your responsibility to brainstorm or ask questions about timing. Disciples, you are far too busy with God's timing for Israel's restoration in this spiritual kingdom. And so Jesus corrects them. They simply have to believe that God the Father holds all times in his hand. And this includes the time frame and turn of events of the kingdom. God the Father, the powerful creator of heaven and earth, determines in his wisdom when things happen in his kingdom. He knows how. His church, also here in Toronto, how it will develop when things will happen here. He equips the church, the spiritual workplace of his spirit, the special workplace in the kingdom. He determines and equips his church in his time and in his way. And he strengthens us to patiently await his kingdom progress. And you know what? Even with all our impatience and our questions, that's okay. It's okay for the Father to determine all that. There's no reason for us to stress about the future of God's kingdom. And this brings us to the second aspect. The Father determines the timing of his kingdom. Verse 7. Congregation, it is interesting that Jesus himself was never too concerned with his Father's kingdom clock. 
or watch. Nor did the, the different stages of the kingdom dominate his messianic work. Jesus very rarely spoke about the hour of his kingdom. Yes, there is Luke twenty two fifty three, where Jesus says, and I'm reading for the, from the New King James Version, while I was with you um, daily in the temple, you did not lay your hands on me, but this hour and the power of this darkness are yours. And also in Matthew 26, 45, he said to his sleeping disciples, Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And also he looks, he, he refers to the hour of the coming of the Son. But that's about it. And there's a reason for this. Because Jesus' goal was always to do what his fathers asked him to do. Not to be too concerned about the timing and the hour of events. And this should also be his disciples and also our goal today. We should not busy ourselves with, with kingdom calculations. Leave that to God. The Father has the times in his hand, in his powerful hand, and he keeps it to himself. And he will reveal whatever decisive kingdom event when and to whom he wants. And this is in line with what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and of that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the angels in heaven concern themselves with time. But my Father only, Jesus says. And so it should not bother us when or where God will establish his kingdom. He didn't send Jesus to answer all kinds of curious questions about God's timing and his eternal decree. Our focus should rather be on what the Father did and is doing in His kingdom. And so our faithful Father is not primarily concerned with time, but with the core of His kingdom, namely the all-determining event on Calvary. And, and, and the tomb, the empty tomb. All roads and times lead to the death and the resurrection of His Son. And from this apex, this core, all God's promises for His disciples, for the church of Christ, flow and will be fulfilled. And so, brothers and sisters, one doesn't hear all kinds of age-related predictions on Golgotha, except that Jesus will come on, rise on the third day. But we, we receive rather promises, promises of forgiveness of sins and of eternal life. Promises that God in His providence will establish His kingdom and will sustain His church until the end of times. And also the promise that before Christ's second coming, He will send His Spirit to empower His disciples to preach the saving kingdom gospel. Also the promise that the disciples will be witnesses and their successors will continue to spread the gospel globally. And, brothers and sisters, these promises are also in line with, with our prayer about God's kingdom. That's why we pray with the Lord's Prayer, let your kingdom come. Now, we don't pray here for times. We pray here, rule us by your word and spirit that we may submit more and more to you, preserve and multiply your church, and destroy the works of the devil and all that rise against you. Lord, thought also all evil plans and devise against you and your holy word until the perfection of your kingdom comes in which you'll be all in all. Isn't that what we confess in Lord's Day 48 of the Heidelberg Catechism? Beautifully summarized. So, beloved, God is in control. He rules. We don't have to be worried about the day of tomorrow. Also in God's kingdom, also in the church. If we remain faithful, if we continue to realize this, indeed truly believe it, then God's Spirit will, will involve us 
in his way and in his time in this process towards the restoration and the consummation of his kingdom. And then, like the disciples, we may busy ourselves in God's kingdom with, with witnessing of our trying God, sharing the good news of his kingdom with everyone in our community, wherever and whenever he gives the opportunity, each one in his own way, according to his received spiritual gifts. And for this reason, and now we come to our third aspect, verse 8, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit, to empower us in our functioning in this kingdom. This is the last aspect. Brothers and sisters, we have seen that the Father determines the timetable of His kingdom. This is what Jesus just showed His disciples and us. They were awaiting the outpouring of the Spirit. and We enjoy the powerful and delightful result of Pentecost. And the time has come for Jesus' disciples in our text to, to tell everyone what really matters in life. What matters in the kingdom of the Father? What is the center, the crux the, of this kingdom? God's redemptive work on Golgotha. Everyone should hear the glad tidings of Christ. That is what the kingdom is all about. And if you continue reading from Acts, you'll, you'll find how Peter's sermon on Pentecost Day is a beautiful result of the way Jesus directed their kingdom expectations. But brothers and sisters, during this remarkable conversation in our text, the Lord Jesus also knew that His disciples were weak in themselves. They would never have the strength to, to start this great commission, this mission work, this outreach work on their own. And by nature, they would not really have liked it. It's not going to be easy. Because the, the, the people, the, the, the missionary target group to which Jesus sent them, were not the most attractive group of people. Imagine yourself. that You must be proclaimed publicly that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And you proclaim that to people who just recently were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. You think they will accept that gospel? Was it the name of Jesus of Nazareth and an annoying sound in their ears? Yes, it was. And imagine yourself preaching the gospel to the Samaritans. I mean, seriously? Except for the inhabitants of, 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 of Sychar in John 4 verse 5, the Samaritans hated the Jews more than the Roman oppressors. Imagine bringing the gospel to them. Imagine sharing the gospel with, with Gentiles, non-believing Romans, Greeks, telling them to destroy their idols, get rid of all their pagan gods, and accept, and accept and believe in, in a crucified divine man as the only true God in the universe? Would they buy that? Wouldn't they get upset, ignore the disciples? Do you, do you think the disciples would have done this, could have done this in their own strength? I don't think so. They were but a small group of 11 men, most of them fishermen, fishers, who didn't even have an, an education like, like the Apostle Paul at Gamaliel's feet. To put it in our terms, they were brothers without any theological training except for the three years apprentice under, under an unregistered Galilean rabbi called Jesus. Will they be able to cope 
with such a, a comprehensive and artist apostolic task in this kingdom? And so humanly speaking, this is mission impossible. And, and similar for us today. You know, we, we often pray and thank God for, for the mission work, and, and, and rightly so, because mission work is, is a difficult calling. But think how, how challenging it is for ourselves to, to participate in, in outreach work in, in, in our own community, to, to be involved in evangelism on, on a personal and organized level. Mission work is, is tough. It's hard. You tell people in different languages and cultures about Jesus. Gospel spreading is an artist's task. Since the full resistance to God's word is, is there, mankind challenges God. And we have the devil trying 24 7 to destroy all efforts of outreach and mission trying to break the church. And that's why Jesus gives and gave in our text these weak brothers, people like us, this great promise. Folks, we need to carefully read what Jesus says here. He does not first he tell them to, to uh, which strategy they need to develop, which, which outreach course or plan they need to implement. Not that these things are completely unimportant. But he says, it's not what you're going to do, but it's what my spirit is going to do. It's what you will receive from me. And Jesus puts this in, in, a, in a powerful, in a strong way. He says, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Not, oh, if you want, or if you see fitting, or if you feel encouraged, or... No, 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 you will be my witnesses. Because you will receive strength. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, He's the one who sends out, out, who sends into this world... And he simultaneously also enables his children to carry it out. This is how we normally operate within his covenant relationship with them. He enables people through his spirit. And when will they receive strength to be witnesses? As the prophet Joel has already said, the Holy Spirit will come on you. Soon the beautiful promises of Joel will be fulfilled. Your children, your sons and daughters will speak, proclaim boldly. No age restriction. No organized way. You or the church will receive the task and the strength to do what God, what Christ wants to happen in His kingdom through His Spirit. And Note how Jesus puts us, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet the Spirit is for this reason called the, the Spirit of strength, Luke 4, verse 14, and Romans 15, 30. God, the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, will Himself start this forward movement. He will come over them and, and take them along on this movement. He will fill them with divine power. And this power will, that would enable them to do things they never thought they could do before will happen. You read Acts 3 and 4 and see how that powerfully eventuated. And thus, congregation, we see the, the Great Commission is embedded in God's amazing and rich promises, promises that will enable the church, also here in Toronto, to, to obediently fulfill this mission. He placed us in our missionary work in the power zone of the Spirit. And whoever believes these promises will also be fully equipped to obey God's call to reach out with the gospel. And I've seen this many times in my ministry. Most introverts, shy people, believers, even, can I say, stutterers like Paul, becoming great instruments 
in God's kingdom. My six-year-old daughter, my, she's now 15, but when she was six-year-old, she, she met a few lads there in a the park, and we were sitting about three, four, five meters from them. And the first thing she asked this, these, these guys were, you know, do, do you believe in Jesus? And they take him back and said, no, no. And, and she told them, you should go to church. You know, there's salvation for you guys. Six-year-old, basic Childish children, mission work, kingdom work, spirit-empowered work. That's why we sing also Psalm 8. Brothers and sisters, the spirit is powerful. He will put, according to his promise, the right words in our mouths to speak. And, and what is all this witnessing about? Well, for the disciples to be witnesses was, was to tell what they've heard and what they saw and smelled and felt in those three years following in Jesus. Simply share what he has faithfully witnessed, said, and did. Sharing everything Jesus has revealed from his Father, especially the, the core of the gospel, God's plan of salvation, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Everyone in God's kingdom, all the earth should know that because of the testimony of the prophets and of the apostles. And God will build His church, the workshop of His kingdom, and He will establish His kingdom through this. And that's why He gave us the gospel. That's why He gave us the, the, the keys of the kingdom of God to be administered in the church. The administration of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, whether you're in Australia or in Canada or wherever in the world, let's just continue to go out. Tell the story of the Old and the New Testament. Not, not only sharing our views uh, of our life story or what we have experienced in faith, but simply let the Spirit fill our mouths with God's Word. And so in our text, we see how Jesus gave His New Testament church this great perspective on God's kingdom. A kingdom in time, but also a kingdom where the soldiers do not pay attention to the times and occasions, but to God's promises. Promises of Pentecostal power to testify to the whole world, to Egypt, Babel, Philistine, Canada, and Australia. And as we participate, brothers and sisters, we can participate with joy, with gladness, instrumental to God for the sake of His glorious name. Our God who makes His kingdom come. Amen.